Hi, and welcome to another edition of Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development with your host, me, Guy Wallace. Note, I've also subtitled this series as The Insomnia Solution. Not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just kidding. This is video number seven, and what I'm going to do in this is take a deeper look at one of my instructional systems design projects curriculum architecture design that led to an ADDIE level, what I now call MCD, Modular Curriculum Development. So I architected an entire curriculum for a job and then I built some of the uh, critical components of that for my client. And they built the rest and some of the content already existed and they were able to get it from inside their system. My client was AT&T Network Systems. This is the uh, manufacturing arm of the old AT&T Ma Bell system, it used to be known as Western Electric. This is where Deming and Duran and many other quality professionals uh, cut their teeth, so to speak, back in the early days of the quality movement. Uh, of course, back in the day, uh, we didn't call these things learning experience design, or a better label for all of that, in my view, is authentic learning experience design. Um, but uh, what we did was call it performance-based instruction or performance-based training and development. Uh, performance was the core, the center, the target for what we were trying to impact. We were trying to affect that performance impact through a logical approach to a structured instruction, a formal instruction. The informal instruction I used to call unstructured OJT. In fact, I still call it unstructured OJT. Uh, later on, 20 some years later, that became known as informal learning. But it was knowledge and skills and tasks that were part of the job that the client in their review of the curriculum architecture decided that was enough. We weren't going to spend another nickel on that stuff. There wasn't perceived to be enough return on any investments in formal content. And it was the kind of stuff that was low stakes, low impact, uh, low risk, low rewards, and was fairly, fairly easy for people to pick up on the job by talking to one of their peers or talking to their managers or just figuring it out through trial and error. Again, not a big deal low-stakes performance. Um, this effort for AT&T Network Systems, uh, I spent a good portion of uh, three to four years of my time beginning in 1986 on this particular project. Once we did the architecture, I was uh, up to my neck, so to speak, in course development, content development uh, for this. This all began as uh, my business partner at the time, Ray Svensson, uh, and I were leaving an uh, NSPI conference, NSPI is now ISPI, in San Francisco in 1986, it was in April. And uh, we were at the airport at the shuttle bus stop waiting for our shuttle bus to take us uh, to wherever we were going. I think we had returned the rental car and we're headed to uh, the airport to catch our flights home and we bumped into one of Ray's former co-workers at AT&T who is now with the Western Electric uh, AT&T Network Systems portion of the business. Uh, they had worked together at AT&T Management in uh, New York City, I believe. It's a long time ago, 1986. Um, and uh, his co the colleague's name was Paul, and for the life of me, I cannot remember what his last name is, and I don't have any documentation that identifies that. But he was just uh, aware of this project that was going to be happening in his organization he wasn't going to be a part of the project, but he just introduced us to the people who were desirous of, of performing, uh, conducting this project. And so we were asked to come in a few days later, and Ray and I flew to New Jersey uh, and met with the client, uh, a guy named Wayne Stewart. Oh, Wayne Stewart. He was a fourth level manager. He was a young guy. Uh, he had was uh, kind of known for being a young guy at a fourth level of management in the AT&T system, which meant he was a really sharp guy and he was going to go places. Um, but uh, he was in charge of this project. He was part of the marketing organization and product managers are part of the marketing organization. Marketing, big M, not little m. We often think of marketing as advertising and promotions. That's the little m part of marketing as I began to look at it and talk about it. The big M is, so what business are we in? What markets are we going to serve? What products and services shall we bring to that market? And who are our competitors and how do we beat them at the game of selling, you know, better, faster and, and more cheap 
for the customers, which were primarily, but not exclusively, the Bell operating companies in the United States. But Network Systems built products for the telephony system globally. Telephony is just a fancy word for the telephone system, but their clients and customers were telephone companies all across the planet. Uh, and they worked closely with Bell Labs. And a few years prior to us starting this project, uh, AT&T went through divestiture. Uh, the federal government of the United States of America decided they should no longer be a monopoly and they were going to break up the monopoly known as Ma Bell. And so that had happened. Uh, the good news for Network System is that none of their customers really knew how to buy from anybody else because they were kind of a captive audience. So they had that going for them and they probably had a few years before their customers found other vendors to sell them things that would fit in the telephony system. Um, but uh, th anyway, so they were in a hurry to kind of address this need for product managers and to develop their professionalism. McKinsey had come in and done a study and said, okay, you don't really have a product management function. Your entire organization that's named that is basically expediters getting things through the factories and to the customer. If a customer in Ohio had one of their central offices burned down, well, they were going to get the next switch, the big switching system, you know, instead of operators, you know, plugging in uh, to make connect calls, that was all electronic switches uh, uh, that were doing that in those days. And uh, there's a schedule that's coming out of manufacturing who's going to get the next product and the one after that and the one after that But if there was a disaster, you know, everybody understood this was how it was going to work. They might get bumped They may not get the next one. They might get the one after that a uh, tornado hits a central office and wipes it out They're going to get the next switch because you need to restore the tele the communication system because it was important to everyone people companies everyone so the goal was to get that put in place and to hurry up the manufacturing component of the organization to produce that thing and get it shipped out there and get the service people to install it and we'll send you a bill and figure out what that bill is later but uh, time's a wasting and make that happen was the goal <coughs> of course that was all going to change drastically the central office that got wiped out might buy a switch from somebody else because those were coming online um, so I, I did a lot of work, and uh, so Ray introduced Paul and, and me at the bus stop. Again, we got invited to come out to New Jersey to talk with them. I, uh, Ray had told Paul at the bus stop about my presentation on curriculum architecture design. This was the second time I'd done a national presentation of this. Uh, Paul was kind of intrigued and thought, hey, that kind of fits. And so we've got this need. We're going to start this big endeavor. Uh, come on in and talk to the people there. And so he coordinated all of that thing. And I don't believe, if I recall correctly, that he was even part of that meeting. He just introduced us to the client. I don't even know if he physically did that or we just showed up and introduced ourselves. Uh, Ray had a lot of credibility. Uh, he's a former Bell Labs engineer. He was a for la former Bell Labs engineering manager. He was a manager at AT&T. He was involved in the strategic planning of AT&T across everything that they were doing. He was sent to the Bell System Center for Technical Education in Lyle, Illinois to do strategic planning for them. They were concerned with the 50,000 engineers across the Bell System in the United States and attended to all of their development needs. Um, so Ray had kind of a name and a reputation, but our clients that we met with didn't know Ray. He'd been he'd left AT&T years before, started his own consulting firm, and that's what I had joined. Um, so I was asked to bring that curriculum architecture presentation, and uh, you know, back, those, these were back in the days when you used overhead transparencies and overhead projectors. Well, I didn't use that. I used flip chart pages to do my presentation at NSPI both in 85 and then in 86. Uh, our flip charts were what we call the double wide easels and paper. Um, twice the width of a standard flip chart page, the same height, but uh, it was so that we could capture data in our the formats that we were using. And Ray had been using this. Uh, I had seen him use this uh, when he presented to us when I was at Motorola. Uh, that's That was the tool that we used to capture data using our group process methodology where we'd bring in what we used to call subject matter experts, but I began to differentiate subject matter experts from master performers. 
I'd been burned by subject matter experts uh, several times in my career when I was at Motorola and I had a pilot that failed because I was given a corporate SME and I didn't find out until after the pilot uh, kind of exploded and blew up and then I had to do the readout of it that my SME, uh, the corporate SME, was seven years in corporate and had been away from the field so he didn't really know what was current what the current job was what the current environment was and so I relied on him as a single SME he guided me I developed the content based on his input and reviews and we went to pilot and it was a major failure so I started calling these people master performers in fact I told the 30 operations uh, managers manufacturing operation managers at Motorola that uh, this is my fault but what we need to do to recover was I need you to give me the top master performers. In fact, I call them exemplars uh, after Tom Gilbert called the, the top performers exemplars. And uh, they didn't like that. It was a $3 college word, they said. And so we settled on calling them master performers, and I've been doing it ever since. Um, so I did my curriculum architecture design presentation. It's a 90-minute presentation. I did it quicker than that. Uh, we talked about... Uh, um, the, the, uh, and we also handed out a 1984 training magazine article that we'd had published. I was a co-author of that uh, on curriculum architecture via a group process. And we talked with the client about, you know, assembling a group of master performers across five of their business sectors, the top master performers. And they were uncomfortable with that. They were uncomfortable asking their internal clients, the leaders of the product management functions in these five business units. Uh, and so we said, okay, well, we can do this the more traditional route, which is basically doing interviews and observations and review of documents. But when you bring a product to market, starting from the first concept of the product all the way through the life cycle from uh, what we ended up calling these was the concept phase and then a justification phase. Can we really make money on it? It's a good idea, but we can't make any money on it, so forget it. Uh, or we go into development and then manufacturing and we do uh, growth as the product takes off and grows and then it reaches this level of maturity where it stabilizes and then it goes into decline because the market is satisfied, uh, sated with everything. They've got more than they've got what they need, no more, except for replacements or there's new technology replacing that product. And so it begins to die off as the new products, the new alternatives come to market. Uh, so uh, we, 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 talked with them about you know okay so you can't observe that you can go talk to people who are operating in the different phases of the life cycle we didn't have uh, labels for that because network systems didn't have the labels for any of the life cycle phases everybody was doing their own thing it was as if it wasn't a bunch of engineering departments working together because they're all working on the same telephony system they're just built these five business sectors are building different components for the central offices and the telephone poles and lines and cabling and everything that it takes to have a telephone system running the cable to your house or your business so that you had telephone service um so it was a mess so we interviewed people and interviewed people and i think we probably spent a month and a half maybe two months interviewing people. Ray and I did this work, these interviews. Uh, my ex-wife Karen was also involved in doing these interviews. And we would come back and get together in our offices in Chicago, in the western suburbs, and talk about what we had found. And it was really difficult to pull this very complex thing together and try to create a unified picture of it. Um, so we would meet, uh, you know, every week and, and debrief on, you know, what we had and everything. And then we'd go back out to New Jersey and I went out to California. I was all over the country talking to product managers about their job. And again, there was no standards for anything. They weren't a product management function and now they were becoming one and everybody was off doing the best they could, doing their own thing. And so there was no uniformity in anything. No such thing as a standard business case or a product plan two key documents that 
you live or die by the quality and receptivity of others of your product plan or your business case. The business case was justifying the, the going into business in the first place and the product plan says here's how we're going to manage it year to year to year. And so you're doing annual biz, uh, product plans on key big products. The client organization managed 500,000 products in five business sectors. There was about 800 people in the product management function, product managers, and the junior people were product planners. Um, and they eventually grew to 1,100 by the time I finished uh, my efforts with them back in 94. This is a long-term engagement that I had with them. Uh, and they, uh, there were the first few years I said that uh, I was probably spending 60 to 70% of my consulting time working for them. I had other clients at the time as well, but they were my main client through all of this. We did all this analysis, and we wrote up our analysis report, and we looked at it, and we didn't like it. So we rewrote the analysis report all over again, took apart all the data, creating a model to how do we frame this job? What makes sense? And we did it a second time and we were not satisfied with that either. And we didn't want to review this with the client until we could stand behind it and explain it. And it would make sense to everybody. And uh, we had to do it a third time. We, and by the time we got to our third iteration on this, we created two models to try to describe what the heck is this job? How does this job work? Now, regardless of what business sector you're in, uh, you were dealing with the life cycle. So your product or products were in one or more phases of the life cycle. So we created a model of that and try to keep it somewhat simple without being too granular. Um, and that was a primary model. People are doing their work in the life cycle but what work are they doing so again in our third iteration of wrangling with all this analysis data uh, we cobbled together a framework a model that we that uh, we might have called eight major duties or eight uh, they became functional areas but there's a lot of language for this key results areas major duties uh, tom gilbert might have called them accomplishments guy now calls them areas of performance um, lots of different language for this thing, but it was chunking out with, so what is the job? So part of the job was doing strategic planning. Then there was tactical planning at many different levels, but there was also financial planning, uh, marketing, market planning, uh, uh, design planning, the Bell Labs engineers, they would do, so these are this, uh, so you're as a product manager are working with the Bell Labs to come up with a design with the right feature set, not too many features to make it too damn expensive for the customer, um, or different options of feature, features to meet the needs of the marketplace. You had to deal with manufacturing, the distribution channel, the sales organizations, many different sales organizations, all the service organizations that did the initial installation, and then they would do maintenance if the customers weren't doing the maintenance themselves. Sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't. So it was all over the map. So we had this two models. Here's the life cycle and here's eight functions, big chunks of the job. Labeling is everything, truth and titling. So we had titled these eight functions and when we did a review with the client, the client got so excited about this that he brought in others. He left the room, brought other people back into the conference room and said, take a look at this. And so we reviewed the life cycle model that we had and they, I think, wordsmithed a couple of the wording on it and then they were happy, they loved it. And then we looked at the eight functions and they tweaked some of that and then two of the people had been in a training course a few weeks earlier and they said hey you know we know how to take this eight chunks of the job and organize a picture of it that would make sense and it became the product management model um, and as you can see the eight chunks there there's uh, slices as you go through the uh, different life cycle phases and who you're primarily work with you know, initially you're working with the engineering organizations and then you're working with the manufacturing organizations and you're working with sales to sell the stuff and then you're working with the service organizations to install it and do the maintenance etc on the through the life cycle but there's these pieces that go through all of those life cycles such as the strategic and tactical planning the financial planning and the marketing planning so those things comprise the eight functions 
Um, what we knew from meeting with a whole bunch of product planners and product managers was that some people owned everything. They had a product or a set of products, often called a product family, um, a whole bunch of related kinds of products, and they were responsible for maybe everything. Well, what you would find is that that was true when the products were kind of mature and you were still selling enough of them to keep wanting to be in that business, but there wasn't a lot of new stuff going on with that stuff. The big stuff, the new stuff, the, the pieces of systems equipment that cost $2 million a piece back in the 80s, um, those product managers and product planners owned chunks of the eight functions. Nobody owned it all except at the very top of their strategic business unit. Um, that person owned everything, but otherwise all their subordinate folks owned different chunks. So there was a, maybe a person or a group do, handling sales and sales support and literature and helping feed the sales organization with everything they needed to sell this stuff. There might be a team of people working with the labs to create the next feature set to add to the product so that the product wouldn't go stale and you'd be adding features to it over the time or eventually you might stop that because you could see new technology coming out of Bell Labs that would either augment or displace your products and you had to plan for that. You might have to actively take your product into discontinuation and get out of the business but yet you had sold the product and you needed to have spare parts for that product for the next 20 years so it wasn't easy to get out of the business it was darn difficult as they say so part of our review of the analysis data they got real excited about that so okay so we had that done so now now uh, Ray and I went back to Chicago and I was given the job because this is the thing I was doing for the organization was I did the curriculum architecture design uh, I forget what number of curriculum architecture this was for me, but I'd probably done eight or nine or ten of them at that point, uh, maybe more. And uh, so I took all the analysis data and created a training and development path. And I created one path because we relied on creating a training and development path to make sure that we had performance sized the content. Um, and it was in modular chunks that would allow people to get exactly what they needed, for the most part, um, and skip the things that they didn't need or already knew. A critical thing, I think, that uh, training organizations were struggling with way back then and still today. Um, and so we had this modularized content um, and the, uh, all kind of bite-sized chunks, you know, micro-learning is the tag we put on that stuff today, but that's not a new concept at all, although m most people in the business, quite frankly, haven't practiced that. Um, but I built the training and development path, and there was a 1,000 series of courses, and a 2,000 series of courses, and a 3,000 series of courses, and you need to kind of think of it as the basics, the intermediate stuff and the advanced stuff. And that's what those three buckets of content uh, re represented. And the front end of the path, the very first module, or what I would call nowadays a training event, a modular training event, the first module was a videotape to explain the whole thing. Because we knew for a fact that if we didn't provide that kind of guidance to everybody, to the supervisors, to the product managers, to the product planners, it wasn't good. The people were scrambling and they were so busy that the poor product planner would never be attended to. And so we put together a videotape to explain to them and their bosses. We were actually trying to manage the, the attendees, the participants in training. We we're trying to manage their expectations and manage the expectations of the boss that they were going to take advantage of this curriculum. They were going to take this path and through a planning guide, the individual uh, training and development planning guide that we put together as part of these curriculum architecture designs that they would use that to take what they needed off the path sequence it to their needs and then set target dates and expect that the people would take the training per the plan um, because the new people oftentimes didn't know what they didn't know didn't know therefore what they needed from a training perspective and so this was to be a collaborative effort between the bosses and the uh, individual contributors whether they were you know a, pl a product planner or a product manager they might be new as well as the organization was dealing with all sorts of turnover and such and they were trying to grow the organization to meet their needs 
to become a product management organization. So the individual planning guide was a really critical component of this. The videotape explained that, explained the path, explained the planning guide and told you, you know, some of your peers may be taking some of these courses because of the nature of their job, which is different. And you'll be taking some of the same, but some different because of the nature of your job. And oh, by the way, here's how we're looking at this job. There's eight major functions to the job of product managers. Some of you own it all, have responsibility for it all, and some of you own a function, and some of you own parts of a function and not the entire function. Take a look around and, and we'll help you figure that out. So the, we had the path. Uh, eventually the client created, because I had been hounding them, uh, I would always suggest to them that the training and development path that we put together on blueprint paper, you need to pretty up. You're the marketing organization. You've got the people that create all the brochures and all that kind of stuff. Create a very pretty training and development path. Uh, it, think of it as a movie poster. You're, this is what we've got for you. And then find the places where people congregate. Where, where do they get coffee? Put that poster, that training and development path up on the wall right there by the coffee pots so people will be there look at it and go oh here's all the training that's available for me and over here in the corner it tells me uh, where to find the planning guide and where how, my supervisor's got a copy of the video I can sit down and look at the video this was all back in the days of VHS tapes so not everybody you know could look at it on their smartphones this was you know way earlier than that so we were marketing this thing by finding where people congregated and giving every one of the client locations wherever there was a product manager, they got one of these paths. Well, it took a couple years for my client to realize that was a good idea and so they started doing it. And the example that you see is that path that was created after I'd done an update to the entire curriculum. And so when we did the update and refreshed it all, they, they knew this was coming. Uh, they waited and then when that was done, they created this visual poster so a visual guide to people in terms of here's the content and of course if you think about this people are scanning the boxes on the path with which each represents you know a chunk of content a deliverable it, you'd administrate this you'd sign people up for it you'd uh, know when they finished it they either they tested out or you didn't do testing we didn't do testing on all of these things um, and but it provided the guidance for this though. So you administrate at the event level these modules of content. Um, and this is where I, it became important to me and it had been important to me, truth and titling. So what is this really all about? What will I get if I take that training? Some of that training was uh, CBT, a big thing back then in the 80s with AT&T. They had the capability, people had the terminals, they could all take computer-based training uh, so, and that made it easier for the client to update. There were other things we put in self-placed booklets and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so you, you, and there was group pace training and we were trying to minimize group pace training because that is so inconvenient for the management and their people because I got to wait for the schedule to roll around. And then if you enroll for it and it's already booked up, then you get bumped to the next class, which might be another three or four months later. So the concept that we that my client bought into, because I said, you know, this is what I'm going to go do unless you stop me, but they like the idea, is that the whole front end of the 1000 series, all but a couple of the boxes on the path, were self-paced videos, computer-based training, booklets that you would read. And in the booklets that you might read, after you took the watched the video, you sat with your supervisor and you developed your plan, you would start taking these modules. And one of them was, you know, welcome to AT&T, the big corporation. Then there was another module on basically welcome to network systems. Here's who we are. This is what we do. This is the markets we operate in. These are our products and services because new people don't know any of that. So we were demystifying the organization at the AT&T level, at the network system level, and then at each of the five strategic business units. And most people only needed to learn about their strategic business unit. But there were some who had a job that where they were highly integrated with these other business units and they needed to learn about them too. So what you'd find in these modules was, here's the leaders' names and their telephone numbers. Here's like a 1-800 number to call in to find your way around and get some guidance. So we had people by name and with a phone number that you could call if you needed to find out something about one of these business units and you didn't know where to go or who to talk to. So we 
This gave guidance to people. These were job aids. So part of the series, the, the 1000 series, all culminated with a module that was titled NS for Network Systems, uh, NS1251. It was the last blue box on the, in the 1000 series. It was an eight-day instructor-led training course that was delivered four or five or six times a year, depending on the demand. I know because I was enticed to deliver all of those, except for one. I had uh, some of my business uh, uh, support staff deliver some of the training one time, but the client wanted me to come in and do all of them, and so I had to do that for them. But there was a series of modules after you demystified the organization and the strategic business units and you understood what products and services, what markets they were going after, then you would take what was called the 1050 series. And there were four modules, if you will, events in that. Um, uh, we started off with um, looking at uh, the introduction to the performance management model these eight functions and within that what are the life cycle phases that you might be working in as you're doing this functional kind of work. Um, so that was intended to demystify this new model that the whole curriculum hung on. So this is the schema that we gave people so that as they were learning things they would go okay that has to do with my job as in sales support or here's where I'm supporting the service organization or here's where I'm dealing with the labs. Um, so we created the framework so that they would um, have a place to hang their hat when they're learning about this or learning about that or trying to figure out and demystify the organization which was in constant flux and changing not drastically but little changes here and there and reorganizations were happening so we had to be careful and worry about going too deep and too granular um, because if we wrote it down and published it it was going to be out of date so we had to find another way to do this. So the 1050 series, the four modules were introduction to the performance management model. And then there was a thing that I talked the clients into. And I remember meeting with the, the leaders at the second level within each of the strategic business units. So not the top person, but the second in command was assembled into what, what my client called the training advisory board tab. And so we had representatives of the product management world to oversee what we were doing and to make sure that they were okay with it. They prioritized what of the modules and training content that didn't exist that they want to have the, their internal resource who hired me get done for them. Uh, they didn't care who did it, they just wanted it done and put in place so that it was available and used by their people to help develop them more quickly. So the second module was the product management novel. And what I had specified in the curriculum architecture design and that they then hired me to develop was what I was guessing was a 100 pages of one year in the life of three product planners learning the job. And I chose three of them so that we could show that here's a person who's developing themselves with the help of the organization to manage the entire eight uh, functions of a product management job for their product family. And here's another product planner who's two cubes over, who's managing a subset of, a, of one of those functions. Not even the whole function, but just a subset of that for a product or a small product family. <clears throat> and then the third product planner was in between and had changed jobs and all this. So the novel talked uh, talked about their entry into the organization, what they were learning, and they would get together for drinks in the evening and commiserate with each other about the job and what they were doing climbing the learning curve. And this and and I remember some of the training advisory board people were skeptical. They didn't think this was a good idea. Guy, no one's going to read this thing. But I was persuasive, and they decided to go ahead and prioritize this and fund it. And it became the most successful module of the whole curriculum. It demystified the job. It explained why the heck it was so different one product planner to the next. Why no one's jobs looked alike. Now. This brought logic and sense to 
why things were the way they were. And there was a logic behind that. We uncovered that. And this made people who I had dealt with uh, in the analysis phase who told us, shared their secrets with us that they were doing this job and they explained it to us. And then they asked, am I doing the job? Because when I look around, everybody's doing something different than me. I don't feel confident that I'm really doing the job correctly. Please help me. And when you hear that enough times when you're doing analysis, you become focused on answering that need because people who are not confident in their own competence, who don't even think they're doing the right job, they need to be assured that it's okay. That's the way it is. Here's the reason behind that. So the product management novel set everybody up. It was ended up not being quite 100 pages, but it was hugely popular. In fact, people who were incumbents got it and, and read it. And it was a pamphlet. It was a book, a saddle stitch little pamphlet uh, uh, with 100 pages in it or just less. Um, and that led them and prepped them and got them ready. It was a huge advanced organizer, as I would tell other people in the training business. Clients don't care about that kind of language. It was an advanced organizer for the next two modules. So you'd learn about the functional model, the PM model, and then you'd read this novel. And it was real, it was authentic. It was actually what was going on. We modeled it. They were working on products that were similar to the products that were existing in the five strategic business units. The next one was a booklet that was a self-paced, do-it-yourself job aids to guide your interviews. And the name of it was your local organization orientation. I said that there was a lot of churn in the organization, reorganization was going on little, little and big. And so today you could go out and start interviewing people and demystify your own organization at a detailed level. Yes, we had a module that described that at a very high level, but who does what? What are the various sub-departments in our organization? Who's in charge? What are their names and phone numbers? Well, if we wrote that down and published it, it was out of date immediately. So this was you going around, filling in this job aid, people's names and their phone numbers. You'd interview them. They'd tell you, we teed up all the questions that people needed to go get answered. And they would have met with their boss private, uh, previously to them going out and doing this and get guidance. Okay, go talk to this person and then talk to that person and then talk to this person and they'll tell you, give you the answers to these things and then they will tell you also who else you need to interview to get this done. So we had people interviewing the people in their own product management function, the people in Bell Labs, the people in the manufacturing, because there are people on the product team from the manufacturing organizations. Well, you can you know, reach out and say hello and you're new to the team and ask them this series of questions, write down their answers, and now you would be better prepared for entering into the fray the fray of product management team meetings, which were notoriously difficult. And often Bell Labs would take over and run the whole darn thing. And that wasn't their job anymore. It was back in the day, you know, two years earlier, but no longer. And so everybody was struggling with this. And if a Bell Labs engineer saw that a product manager was weak and not sure what they were doing, they weren't going to let that get in their way. They'd take over the meeting and run the whole darn thing, and then pretty soon you'd know that the product had every feature set that could be imagined by Bell Labs and created in there. Whether it was stable enough to be in there, or it was a newfangled stuff that wasn't quite ready for prime time, but they were building it anyway. Um, so the product management organization had been losing control, and they knew that. So they were very excited that we brought all this stuff in. So the 1053 module, local organization or orientation. So now you've demystified your own organization and all the players on your product team. And now it was time for you to demystify your job orientation. So this is where you got down to brass tacks and figured out which of these eight functions do I own? All of them, one of them, partial, or a partial here and a partial there and a partial there because of the way we're organized and think the assignments are. So you could pin down what parts of the job, the overall job model, performance model, uh, functional model, uh, were, were yours. And what were the outputs and when were they due and what were the major tasks that people expected you to go through in order to produce that deliverable, that output. We were teaching them basically how to do their own job analysis. 
so that they could figure out. But we had, you know, here's the, the total set. So now you're just figuring out which of these pieces do I own? Here's the standard kind of outputs. Do, am I responsible for these? Yes or no is the answer. I'm partially responsible. I'm co-responsible or no, I'm not responsible. Um, when is this thing due next in, in the way things are going? Well, on this product, it's due next week. On that product, it's due next month. On this one here, probably near the end of the year. Who knows? So people could at least pin that down so they could make the fuzzy stuff a little less fuzzy or crystal clear. And then they could start to talk about the tasks that were expected in order to produce these outputs. The outputs were a business case, a product plan, getting ready for a national sales show, going on customer visits. And so what, what your deliverable might be is the sales support for the sales organization. And you're going to tag along with the salespeople, although they want you to shut up and not say anything. Don't overhang the market. Don't say, oh, well, you know, and the next year we're coming out with this other stuff. We'll have all these features on it. And then the customer might decide, oh, well, maybe we should wait till next year to buy that. And the salespeople would want to shoot you. And so we had to tell product managers when you're going on sales calls and things like that, shut up. Don't say anything. Don't overhang the market. Don't inhibit today's sale by promising things that you may or may not actually bring to the market in the time frame that you're saying because who knows? Things could happen. You might be planning on doing something and a new technology comes out and you're not going to be in that business anymore. You're going to do a new thing. So don't be screwing up the sales quotas and achieving them because your product plan is based on a certain set of financials, which means manufacturing is going to produce things at a certain cost. Sales is going to sell them at a certain price. There's a margin in there that's called profit until when we pay the overhead and your salaries and the building and the heating and the telephone. So the product plans had a financial component to that. And regardless of where you are and what your responsibilities are, you had to know how score was kept. So AT&T network systems had a very unique way of calculating earnings before interest and taxes. Um, how to calculate profitability. Uh, what is the cost of money? Because you've got to subtract that as you take a loan, so to speak, invest it in a product and then pay the company back. Well, there's a cost to you taking money out of the organization, shareholder equity, and then investing it in your product. And that's not free money. So if you're going to bring a new product to market and then get it out to market and it starts selling, when are we going to get our money back? When's the payback period to where we've broken even and it's as if we you know, didn't do anything at all, we just got our money back. And now, when do we start making profit that we can contribute to the corporation? So, it, you know, people who had been through MBA programs told us that finally this was demystified. Finally, they could figure out how score was kept because the financial scoreboard was the biggest thing. And yeah, nobody cared if you had the interpersonal skills or not, if you were making the money and managing the product. Now, of course, you can't let people be jerks. Because and, and anger the entire product team because then you won't get their cooperation. So that was one of the things we also had to teach was how do you actually plan for and conduct product team meetings? And so there was this modular curriculum. You learned all this stuff. You took the 1050 series. You got your job demystified. You took some courses on, you know, Word and PowerPoint and those kinds of things. You learned how to run a bunch of the AT&T systems that were in place to help you do your job. Uh, how to... Uh, uh, get travel advances and how to ex uh, turn in your expense reports, you know, things that are actually kind of critical to people that get caught up in that and don't get their money back because they messed up and didn't get the right receipts and, I mean, lots of detailed stuff. But everybody took what they needed in the 1000 series with the intent of going to the 1251 course, this eight day course, the Keystone course at the end of the 1000 series. Um, this became a very popular course. It was in high demand. My clients would often schedule four of these uh, and then want to add a couple more throughout the year with me and had to negotiate with me and my availability because I had other clients beside them, even though they were the majority of my time. But either if I went and made a delivery, then I was going to blow the schedule on something else, which had downstream impacts. And so this was something that we had to manage carefully. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about this 1251 Keystone course and 
I created a game, a simulation. I had a simulation exercise that had 25 rounds. So we took the five phases of the life cycle, which were concept, then justification, then development, then growth and maturity, and then decline and discontinuance. And so an individual participant in this course was going to be assigned to be a product manager for one of five products. The five products were the camera, the recorder, the editing deck, the cables, and videotape, which have to work as a system, just like telephony products. They have to work as a system. So either the cables plug into the editing deck from the camera and they actually work, or you're using the wrong plug and this thing isn't going to work as a system. So there's all this coordination that had to happen, which had to be part of what a product team attended to especially if technology is changing and the kind of plugging you're going to use is going to evolve and go to the next uh, the next iteration of technology um, but anyway so there so then uh, I remember one of the training advisory board managers saying well we should turn this into a computer game and uh, that'll you know then they can learn that way and I was really opposed to that because there was more variation in this thing and we were also concerned they were my my clients were all concerned about well if people go to this class and they go through this simulation exercise guide which sounds really cool they're going to tell their peers back there and they're going to be able to cheat when they come to the class and they're going to be able to win and everybody was missing the point that there was no winning you were going to run product team meetings gather everybody's data create your updated product plan with the financials and either those financials were good and okay or they weren't any good at all and you guys are gonna have to rework all these numbers not by pretending that costs were gonna be lower and you're gonna sell at a higher price but by getting these organizations that you're working with to agree that they could get the costs down and sell at a higher price and sell a larger volume and the manufacturing when their volumes went up their individual costs went down when the volume went up, the sales organization made their sales quota, but they always wanted a lower price. And manufacturing always wanted a higher cost of goods being given to them and not being squeezed so much. So there was all these challenges. So to deal with this issue of people cheating, when I created the simulation exercise, I created a game board and you would roll dice just like in monopoly or something and you would move your piece forward along the board and if you hit a brakes uh, symbol you would have to draw a brakes card think of community chest and the other thing in on monopoly and you'd grab this card and you would read the card aloud to the team members and what we had is that there were two people as product managers, two people uh, in engineering, two people in manufacturing, two people in sales support, two people in service. And you would pull up this card and you would say, the, the factory burned down, you're going to have to shift uh, production over to another factory, you're going to have a three month delay, and your cost of goods is going to go up by 10%. Oh, this card is for the manufacturing people. Now, we, you, everybody was given what we called a data pack, and the data pack gave you guidance so you could do your role play, but now this chain, this brakes card, one third of the brakes were good, two thirds of the brakes were bad brakes, and you'd hand this card over to those people and they would have to change the data in their data pack, which meant every time we ran this, it was different. Everybody was dealing with different uh, uh, data uh, to give to the product management team plan. It was a team plan, not the product planner's plan, not the product management organization's plan. This was the product team's plan. And everybody had to agree and sign up for what was in the plan um, because they had to go back to their organizations and explain what the hell they agreed to and now deliver on that. So one of the things that product planners and product managers had to appreciate is that when somebody's in there and they're resisting what you are asking them, they're resisting it on behalf of their entire organization. Because if you got sales degree, instead of selling 100,000 of these, you're going to sell half a million, 500,000 of these. Uh, they're going to go back to their organization. They're going to get beat up. 
they're going to get told, go back to the product management team and tell them, no way, we're going to sell 125000 but that's all we're signing up for. Well, that would change your product plan and the financials. And so it didn't do any good to pretend. It didn't do any good to twist somebody's arm and get them to agree something that they couldn't sell back at the shop, back at the ranch, back in their unit. Um, and so product managers didn't have a full appreciation of that. And so when these people in our class were sitting in these other roles, they had to represent the real world issues in each of the life cycle phases. So we'd have two people playing the role of product manager on the camera. Then we would go through all that. They'd have all their data, but before they could go off and rush and create their product plan, we'd switch hats. And these people, the product managers would become the service people and the engineering people would become the product managers and they'd work on that next product and they'd run their team meeting. And I'd have to represent the service organization talking about how you manufacturing people always manufacture stuff that I can't install easily. To install your thing, I gotta take four things out and then put that in and put these other things back. What the heck design is this Bell Labs? You designed it in a clunky fashion here, increasing my service costs. So they began to learn for, about things such as design for the X, design for manufacturability, design for serviceability and maintainability, ins installation ability, and all of these things. So they were learning about the real world issues, not for cameras and recorders and editing decks, but the real world issues in their world. When you're in this part of the life cycle, this is what sales is concerned about. This is what service is concerned about. This is what Bell Labs is concerned about. And now you've been duly sensitized to these issues. And that was your heads up. When you go work on a, on a product team here, this is what they're worried about. And you need to be sensitive to that and work with them to come up with the best product plan and calculate the financials based on whatever you agreed to. And we had people who would cheat the financials and they go, oh, they sales said this, but I'm changing it to that. And then we would nail them when they did their readouts of their product plans going, hey, that's not what sales said. So that's your product plan. You sold that to your management. Now sales says no way. And now you got egg on your face. You're gonna have to explain to your management why you have to revise all these numbers. And you know whose numbers then that changes? your boss's numbers and your boss's boss's numbers all the way up to the top of the organization and beyond your strategic business unit all the way up to Mr. or Ms. Network Systems who isn't happy when these numbers change and all of a sudden the sales forecasts go down, the cost of goods goes up, the real world intercedes and your plan was just baloney and now your credibility is toast. So people kind of knew that but they didn't know how to deal with it, they didn't know how to work with teams um, and they were too often being overrun by the Bell Labs engineers. So, so as, a, as a person in this course, I would play the role of product managers five times. One time for each of the phases of the life cycle for my product camera. Somebody else would do the recorder, etc. all these products. And, and then I would, so out of, we had 25 role plays, if you will, and I was the product manager for five of them. And I played each of these other roles, these other four roles, five times. So I sat in an additional 20 meetings where I was representing real world issues from these organizations at each stage of the life cycle because sometimes the issues are the same, sometimes they're very different. And so I had this model, this schema now to place all of this insight into what I was going to be expected to do. So this course, uh, we did the pilot session on October 19th, 1987. Uh, those of you who were around then and had money in the in the stock market would know this was one of the times when the stock market fell through the floor and people were jumping up out of our room. They were getting phone calls <clears throat> and leaving um, to go attend to call their stockbrokers and find out how badly they'd been hurt and all this. So it was a kind of interesting time. But uh, again, I did 31 deliveries of this. Um, my client put together the videotape that was the very first module. I have a copy of that. They gave it to me. My client was uh, kind enough to give this to me for marketing purposes. Um, but there was a real interesting story that came out of this. And, and my client, Wayne Stewart, told me about this afterwards. And, and one of the people that was a product planner 
uh, was a, a young woman whose father owned the service organization for AT&T Network Systems. So she, she was going to go places because of her daddy. And uh, she, there was a very interesting story, and so I was told the story, and then I called her up and asked her about it, and she told me the same thing. But she went into her product team meeting, and her boss and her boss's boss was with her because this was she was just going to take it over now and and they wanted to see how the kid was doing you know and you know we we know the old man so we've got to you know attend to her needs she went to the university of oklahoma because she was uh <clears throat> this this was in the next year is when kansas won the national championship and beat oklahoma so i was able to call her up again and and razz her about this because she was razzing me about the basketball teams but anyway so uh so the story was is that they flew um to their site where the product team meeting was going to be and they got it into the room and all this stuff and uh what the bell labs people did is they took a couple of binders worth of content and made their case and took these binders and put it on the table the conference table in front of her boom and they gave her all this reason to why, why things had to be the way they wanted it to be from a Bell Labs perspective <laughs> and uh, she stood up after they were done and picked up their binders and went back and gave it to them and said this is why you're on the payroll to do this I'm not gonna read this stuff this is your job but this is what you're going to do for me because these features that you want to build into these products we're not going to do because we can't afford it if you look at the financials here that's just going to add cost to the manufacturing of this raising our cost of goods that means we're going to have to raise the price here we're under price pressure in the marketplace with the competition so we're not doing that now I think her, the story was her boss and her boss's boss almost wet their pants because they had never seen anything like this. Here was this young whippersnapper of a product planner here who went toe to toe with Bell Labs and told them, yeah, I see all your data, here's all your, but I'm not even gonna look at this stuff here, that's what you're here for. Boom, you can have that back. But this is what we're gonna do, and this is what you're gonna do. And then manufacturing, this is what you're gonna do. now." tell us give me your input your feedback here what's doable and then sales okay if we do that product with that limited feature set and manufacturing can do it at this cost with the margin that we're going after where the price needs to be this and for volume discounts and people are gonna buy and in, in volume this is what we'll do for them how many units are you guys willing to uh, sell and she ran her product team meeting just like in the simulation exercise and again, her bosses were so excited about this. They had never seen anything like it. So the people from that strategic business unit, all the new product planners, they got signed up for this course because they wanted everybody to operate like just like she did. But she worked her team and brought them to a consensus. They understood what the issues were. They understood where they needed to go and what each one of these functional entities needed to do and go back to the ranch back to their strategic their unit and negotiate internally with their unit to agree to a higher sales volume to agree to a lower cost of goods to get the labs to agree that they weren't going to put every one of these features that they could put in it but they were going to put it in a limited set and that we might bring some of those additional features that we're going to forego right now we'll bring them out next year or the year after but we don't know. First of all, we have to have a successful launch of this product. It was a, uh, it was a replacement product. It wasn't brand new, but it was displacing older technology. So, of course, the guy that ran the service organization, this is his kid, and she went in there and set the world on fire, and her bosses were amazed, and so he heard about it. Everybody in the middle management ranks up to the top heard about this, and our course was very popular and in high demand, and so I was asked to do a couple extra deliveries the next year, and Wayne Stewart had said to me, 
you know, guy, we want you to, after I'd done the pilot session, he says, uh, and then, you know, I said, you know, now we'll do the next session. Now that I've piloted this and we know what we got to change and update. And there, of course, there were things like that. We needed a tweak and we went from 10 days down to eight days. And the pilot sessions take longer because of all the debriefings after every key couple of lessons, we would debrief get the feedback from people and then move on and try to, you know, represent earlier changes that should have been but weren't, you know, try to make sure that we put that into the downstream content over the 10 days. So we were able to skinny it back down to eight days, maintain the simulation exercise, which everybody loved. Um, but he said he, uh, he said he didn't want to bring in people from their training organization uh, to learn this because there's no way they would know what I knew about the organization because I'd done so many stinking interviews with people uh, that I knew quite a bit about the organization, more than the average product manager anywhere in the system, because I'd had the luxury of interviewing people all over the place at all the levels of the organization, across the breadth of the organization. So while I was certainly no expert, I understood what was going on and what some of the key issues were. So they asked me if I would do the deliveries and, and I said, you know, I don't do deliveries. This is the only delivery I've ever done in the training business other than delivering a Kepner Trago uh, problem solving course at Baxter International in the Chicagoland area. And I did that as a favor to for Ray Svensson who, who knew the people at Baxter and they needed somebody to come in and do that. So I'd never. So anyway, I didn't really want to do it, but they said he said Wayne Stewart said, if you do the deliveries on this thing here, I'll give you as much development work as you want. So he slapped the golden handcuffs on me and I just agreed that I'd do the deliveries and I wouldn't be training the instructors. I would be one. And the other guy that helped me deliver this first pilot session uh, was going to help me. And then he left us and so I brought in other people to deliver it. But basically I was the one who delivered 90% of it. Um, we split a group of 20 into two groups of 10, paired them up. So we actually ran these simulation exercises, two groups in complete parallel. Of course, they'd get together in the evenings and at meals and and talk about what they were doing versus the other one. And somebody would say, well, my cost of goods is this. The other one goes, well, mine is something different. They go look, well, why is this different? The brakes cards. Oh, you got different breaks than I did. So that was that variation. So they couldn't cheat one room, break room to the next as they were running these meetings. Um, so that was, so uh, I got, got all this extra development work. So I started developing other parts of the curriculum uh, on behalf of this client. And then Wayne Stewart did me even one better. He lined up several different curriculum architecture projects with other parts of network systems and even outside of network systems in other parts of AT&T. So it was a huge win from him, uh, a huge win for me. And uh, uh, he was one of the best clients that I'd ever worked with. Um, he was truly a businessman, uh, understood the, you know, the nature of, you know, business and profit and loss and all of that. And uh, he supported us. In fact, when I came up with this crazy idea that, well, we have people doing these role plays and we don't want them to just capitulate to the demands of the product manager. We want them to stick to their guns. If your data pack said, the data packs were interesting. This, it's always started off with a letter from your boss. Oh no, a letter from the product manager who told you, okay, this is what we're gonna do in this meeting. Here's the agenda, here's the goals, this is what we gotta do. The second thing in your data pack was a letter from your boss who said, under no circumstances, agree to this or that or this or that. And, uh, and you can only trade off some of these things here. You know, we're not willing to sign up for 200,000 uh, sales volume unless you get the price below this. But here's a little table. So basically you had to go in there and role play and represent your organization. You just couldn't say, okay, you know, that was no good. That wasn't real. We wanted this to be authentic. So the sales organization says, the hell you say, I'm not agreeing to that price. No way. In fact, we're going to, we'll, we'll only agree to half of that. So there was a lot of role playing in this. So I convinced the, the client that, you know, so the, uh, so it was an eight-day course, so it was one week, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And on Tuesday evenings, the evening before the last day, we would go out as a group and have a big dinner. And 
we as part of the dinner and pizza and beer basically and and networks has paid for this because they were going to pay for dinner anyway but we and we would tell people you can do anything you want but on the next tuesday night you're going to go out we're going to go out as one big group here and we're going to have an awards ceremony and we gave out awards for you know the best product plan the best role play in sales the best role play in manufacturing the best role play in product management and uh, we had all these crazy categories and we even allowed people to nominate others for awards that they made up and we'd have little certificates and we'd hand these things out and we made a big deal about this and we started asking our client, whatever location we were in, we deliver this in the Boston area, we deliver this in Atlanta, we deliver this in Chicago, we deliver this in New Jersey, and then in the Netherlands. Um, and we would invite the local product managers to come in and go to dinner with us on that Tuesday evening and then come on Wednesday and see the final product plans that were being presented. And what people were doing in the final product plan was that last phase of the life cycle, decline and discontinuance. And what we did is we, we said, okay, the, the product the line is going to change. We're going to get out of the videotape business. We're going to go to digital CD discs. This was 87. And I had read about, you know, what's going to replace analog tape? discs digitized discs not analog and so so i we introduced that you're gonna be having a plan to get rid of your current product what are the changes well the tape business are they really going out of business or are the tape people gonna have to run two different products now discs and tapes because you have an installed base out there and the tape business ain't going away in in fact maybe the the sales volume will begin to slow down and deteriorate a little bit but you're gonna ramp up selling all these discs and so there's gonna be a need for recorders that don't record on tape anymore but are we're gonna be recording on discs we have an embedded base out there of all this we're gonna to have to have spare parts for these people because we have service contracts with them and when we sold it to them we agreed that we'd supply parts for 20 years because that's how they do it in the telephone business or used to uh, and probably still do today um, and is the camera gonna change maybe is the recorder gonna change for sure what about the editing equipment maybe just a little bit what about the cables no not you know we weren't introducing wireless because that wasn't around back then in the late 80s but so so these business leaders these product managers uh, top middle and top management would come in they'd come to dinner they'd hear all this stuff they'd go well i wasn't planning on coming but yeah, i'm going to be there so they'd show up and we'd have these final presentations and of course, as managers are wont to do, they would, they would critique, oh, well, you should have had this, you should have done this, you should have done that. Well, they weren't part of the product team meeting, so they didn't know that sales wasn't going to agree to that. And sales had told you, let me quote this letter from my boss. My boss, boss says, no way. And if you agree to that, you better start looking for a new job. I hope your resume is updated because we're not agreeing to that. And so, you know, somebody role playing now isn't going to agree to that. But so the managers came in here and they weren't always happy. And then my client, Wayne Stewart, would have to take them aside and explain all of this. And they weren't too sure that they didn't like this. They thought, you know, people should come up with stellar financials, you know, that's had high margins. And, you know, but that wasn't real. People were struggling to get the organizations to agree on costs and prices and volumes and when we were going to bring the new product to market and you know break the bell labs might have gotten a brakes card that said you're going to be six months late to market with the new feature set so you're not going to be able to raise the price manufacturing won't have those additional costs uh incurred because they're putting new features into the product and so it was all over the place but the goal wasn't to game the system the goal was to figure out what's what what are the real numbers as best as we can estimate them and guess them 
and let's calculate the financials and maybe we're just fine maybe we're just uh just okay maybe we're just a not so okay or maybe we're way out of the ballpark here and the business if they saw these would shut us down so do we want to have this shut down no so how do we work together what is it that we have to do what's the game plan then for labs to representatives to go back to the labs and work with their management and team to get things better in manufacturing and sales and service so that was it, it, it was a very powerful course and i did this up until 94 doing the five sessions in the netherlands i'd gone over the netherlands reviewed the whole program with everybody did a pilot session over there their management wanted them to figure out that one of the people that went through the pilot session to figure out a way to take this from eight days to three days that was their goal and every last of the 20 people that sat through that pilot session told their managers no way in hell are we going to agree to that you need to keep this eight days because of what we learned you should have shown up to last night's uh, party you should have come in and seen the you know the final presentations this is what we did and they were all I mean the the couple of managers that were sitting there that had brought in this hey can we get this down to three days they caught a pile of feedback that said they shouldn't maybe ought to do this and so they decided to entertain the notion here of keeping it eight days for a while and then we'll skinny it down so after I left in 94 doing this and AT&T was getting, uh, Network Systems was getting ready for some big changes, um, they were going to be spun off from AT&T. Um, this wasn't quite happening, but I'm sure the people, you know, doing all that planning and getting ready for this knew about it. And so I was to turn this over to the internal AT&T training organization and two of the instructors came over to the Netherlands and watched me deliver it there. They watched me deliver it, I think, twice in the United States, and then they took it over, and their charge was to get this down to three days. Well, it went down to three days. They delivered it for a year, and then no one wanted to come to it anymore because it wasn't quite the same. Uh, the instructors, unfortunately, they didn't really understand the world of product management. They were, they'd make up answers. If they were given answers, I'd cringe at the back of the room when they were doing the facilitation and I was observing them because they'd get asked a question and they would give an answer and it would be totally wrong, totally made up. Um, and those are the kinds of things that uh, training organizations do to their customers. They put people that are not prepared well enough into a position to deploy and deliver content to provide answers to reasonable logical questions and misguide the learners. Um, they did, don't often really understand the job at a detail level nuanced enough to build in the real world barriers that people face. Running a product team meeting is not as easy as one, two, three, and you do this and you follow the agenda and it's, hey, it's a piece of cake each and every time. No. You start with an agenda, you try to follow that, and you deal with the real world, and you roll with the punches, and you get up from the roll from the punches, and you attend to what needs to be done. you got to figure out, okay, so what is it that we have to do? If our financials are not good enough, what part of the financials is not good enough? What if we change this a little bit? What if we change that a little bit? What, let's recalculate them. And to get the entire product team to own the financials. The financials are not the product managers. It's the teams. All of the organizations are going to live and die as to whether or not this product is successful. And if we bring a product to market thinking that we're going to be very successful with this and it falls on its face because it's got the wrong feature set, the price is good but the feature set is no good. Or the technology is the old stuff in the, in the customer world. The marketplace is moving on. You have to deal with these things. You have to anticipate these things. You have to be prepared for things not going quite right. And what are you going to do? Anyway, <clears throat> thank you for attending to this. This is uh, video seven in my series, Adventures in Training Based, uh, Performance Based Training and Development, with your host, me, Guy Wallace. This is also known as the Insomnia Solution, not my insomnia, yours. Just kidding. Cheers.
Those who are a part of the world of AT&T Network Systems product management travel in no ordinary circles. It's a world as diverse as the world of AT&T itself. Your guide to this world is the Network Systems product management curriculum. Over a hundred modules give you the skills and knowledge you might need to find your way, no matter what your business unit or job responsibilities. For example, part of your job as a product planner in media might be strategic or business planning. You make sure that the strategic plans for your product reflect the goals, the constraints, and the changes in the organization's higher level strategic and business plans. You are responsible for one of the eight major product management functions. Perhaps you're a product planner in switching product management. Part of your job might involve market analysis. You are responsible for competitive product analysis and market share forecasts. This is another of the key product management functions. Or maybe you're responsible for financial analysis for a transmission product. Your responsibilities might include revenue forecasts and product pricing strategies for a single product. This is still another of the eight key product management functions. Perhaps you are responsible for an operations systems product that is under development. You are handling yet another major PM function, product development planning and management. Your job might involve specifying and negotiating product deliverables, schedules, and costs. You would work with Bell Labs to manage the development effort. No matter what business unit you work in, during a product's life cycle, you may help plan and manage the manufacturing and physical distribution of the product. This includes working with various manufacturing organizations to obtain planning documents, such as a manufacturing plan, or a manufacturing process design, or a physical distribution plan. As your product comes to market, you may be responsible for negotiating sales objectives with the sales organization, and planning and controlling sales support activities. You do this to ensure that we achieve the marketing objectives for the product. You might manage the development and implementation of a sales support plan. Another major function is product support. This involves managing the availability of such things as product documentation, training, and installation. Seven major functions, and one last function that you do regardless of your job. Planning at the tactical level. You deal with organizations like Bell Labs, manufacturing, sales operations, and market operations. Depending on where your product is in the life cycle, you deliver, update, and execute business proposals, business cases, or product plans. Tactical planning, just like market analysis, financial analysis, and strategic planning, runs through product development, manufacturing, and the support functions. You may develop and implement plans for a product or for a strategic business unit, often called an SBU, which can consist of a group of products. Eight PM functions in our product management model, and each of them is an important part of the PM job. Your job responsibilities may involve a single product and function, or multiple functions. For example, market data analysis and sales support, or multiple products. Your job may even consist of one or more functions for an entire product line. The product management model helps illustrate the total PM function, and it can also help you prepare for your job by identifying the functions for which you have responsibility. In turn, this highlights the areas where you need certain skills and knowledge. And where do you get the skills you need for all these parts of your job? Where do you get the knowledge? Some of it you already have. Some of it comes with experience. But much of it you'll learn through training available in the Network Systems Product Management Curriculum. The curriculum makes three different series of modules available to you, with basic, 
intermediate and advanced skills in a variety of business and management areas. First, product management basics, the 1000 series. Second, general functional product management knowledge and skills in the 2000 series. And third, advanced skills and knowledge in the 3000 series. Most of the modules in these series are optional. For example, the first modules in the 1000 series. These modules are computer-based lessons about 15 minutes long. They describe the different AT&T lines of business. Other modules tell you about various internal and external influences on your job. For example, regulatory restrictions. Still other modules cover AT&T organizations that you may have to work with. Organizations like Bell Labs or the Document Development Organization. These online modules are easily accessible at any time for training or reference. One series of four text-based modules introduces new product planners to their jobs. Modules 1051 through 1054. The 1000 series concludes with an eight-day group-paced course covering the network system product management process. Find out about any of these modules in your supervisor's curriculum catalog. The 2000 series modules give specific skills and knowledge to product planners and managers who already have some experience. Groups of modules in this series focus on areas of general product management skills, such as how to conduct meetings. There are also modules for personal development skills, such as negotiating or business writing. Some modules cover the PM functions you saw in the PM model, for example, the planning and management of the manufacturing function. And other 2000 series modules provide generic management and supervision training. For modules teaching still more advanced PM skills and knowledge, there's the 3000 series. You'll find advanced modules on general skills, such as managing projects and project teams. Another group of modules teaches advanced personal development skills, such as problem solving. And still another group goes into PM managerial development. There are modules geared to every aspect of the PM job, and the curriculum will evolve to meet the changing needs of the organization. You'll tailor your own training plan to match your job. What's the best way to start? Use the curriculum catalog to see which of the modules you might need in the very first series, the 1000 series. If you need to, find out about AT&T Corporate, the end user organization, Bell Labs, Network Systems, Technology Systems, and International. Then go through the 1050 series. First, the PM Functional Performance Model Overview. More detail about the eight functions you've seen in this video. There's the PM Novel, fictional descriptions of real things that happen in the PM job. Then Module 1053, an orientation to your local PM business unit. And the 1050 series concludes with an orientation to the PM job. You'll find that part of Module 1054 requires you to develop a training plan with your supervisor. You and your supervisor can use the curriculum planning guide to develop your training plan. Based on the way your job is defined in Module 1054, you'll identify the modules you need. There are modules directed at PMs new to AT&T and modules for those who have experience with the company. After you choose the appropriate modules for you and your job, you'll set up a schedule for taking them. Follow the registration procedures in your curriculum catalog. All of these modules, of course, are simply tools. So are the catalog and the curriculum planning guide. They're tools designed to help you become more effective on the job. The curriculum requires your time, your effort, your commitment. But from it, you get the knowledge and skills that will help you succeed. The Network Systems Product Management Curriculum. A curriculum customized for your complex and challenging job in the world of Network Systems Product Management.